friend, the gentleman, uh, Majority Leader from Maryland, Mr. Hoyer. I want my friend, the, the uh, Republican whip, to know that I did not object to his unanimous consent request. I've got <laughs> a few others if, if there's no objection that I'd like to make. <laughs> On Monday, uh, Mr. Speaker, the House will meet at 12 p.m. for morning hour and 2 p.m. for legislative business and votes postponed until 6.30 p.m. On Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, the House will meet at 10 a.m. for morning hour and 12 p.m. for legislative business. On Friday, the House will meet at 9 a.m. for legislative business. Now, Mr. Speaker, the House will consider several bills under suspension of the rules. The complete list of suspension bills will be announced by the close of business today. The Budget Committee, uh, Mr. Speaker, has announced a markup for Build Back Better Act for tomorrow and uh, Saturday. It's my intention to bring it to the floor next week. This legislation will help move tens of millions of Americans closer to economic security while also making transformational investments in making child care more affordable, helping Americans access health care, and addressing climate change with the seriousness that it deserves and demands. On September 27th, pursuant to the rule passed in August, on August 24th, the House will consider the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. This legislation passed the Senate on a bipartisan basis last month and would create millions of good jobs all across America by investing in critical infrastructure. That bill and the Build Back Better America Act uh, are the uh, essence of uh, the vision and program that has been proposed by President Biden, uh, which, as I said, would grow millions of jobs and make the lives of Americans more secure and safer. If time allows, Mr. Speaker, the House may also consider three bills from the Education and Labor Committee. H.R. 3110, the Pump for Nursing Mothers Act, which amends the Fair Labor Standards Act to provide workplace protections for mothers to pump breast milk in the workplace. H.R. 3992, the Protecting Older Job Applications, Applicants Act, which allows applicants to bring a disparate impact claim under the Age Discrimination and Employment Act of 1967 when they experience age discrimination while seeking a job. In addition, H.R. 2119, the Family Violence Prevention and Services Improvement Act of 2021, which modifies uh, the, uh, and expands uh, and reauthorizes the fiscal year 2026 Family Violence and Prevention Services Program, which funds emergency shelters, uh, supports related assistance for victims of domestic violence. Lastly, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, there may be additional legislative uh, items as possible and as necessary. And I yield back uh, to the uh, leader, the, the whip. Thank the gentleman. As it relates to the reconciliation bill that the Budget Committee will be taking up tomorrow, uh, the initial estimates on that bill uh, were that it would in roughly add up to be about three and a half trillion dollars in new taxes and spending. There's now estimates that that number will mushroom to well over 4.2, 4.3 trillion or higher, but we still don't have a CBO score on the lion's share of that legislation. And from word we're getting from CBO, it may be weeks or months that we would get that score. Does the gentleman know what the timeline is for getting an actual estimate from CBO on what the cost of that legislation is and will be come tomorrow when the budget committee takes it up? Uh, I have, uh, the Budget Committee is going to take it up tomorrow. They don't need a CBO score for that. Uh, but uh, I, the Budget uh, Committee Chairman is seeking a CBO score as soon as that can be attained, but I don't know uh, that particular date uh, that that will occur. Clearly, this bill has been under consideration for a very long period of time. Uh, the President proposed it a very long time ago, some uh, in the early part of the uh, last year, or this year. And uh, so uh, it, it is something that the CBO has been considering, the committees have been considering, and so hopefully the CBO can, can produce a score uh, relatively quickly. But I don't, I don't, in answer to the gentleman's question, have a specific time or date. And thank the gentleman. I know last week, as I think we had about a dozen committees in Congress took up different parts of that bill. Unfortunately, it seems that the cost keeps going up. Uh, could we get an assurance that before the bill actually comes to the floor for a vote before this House, 
that we would get a CBO score uh, to know how many trillions of dollars in new taxes and in new spending would be included and voted on before the House. Uh, it's my expectation that we will uh, be getting a score. Uh, I want to tell the gentleman, it is also my understanding that uh, the expenditures that will be proposed will be paid for. And obviously paid for would include new taxes, including new things revenue. like that are in this bill. Uh, there is a tax on natural gas, which every family in America that uses natural gas to heat their homes in winter or cool their homes in the summer would have to pay. I, I know President Biden had committed that nobody making under 400000 would pay any new amount in taxes. Clearly, that provision of the bill would violate President Biden's pledge. I'm not sure if the gentleman anticipates new taxes like that being removed from the bill so that the president's pledge would not be violated. Uh, if you have any insight on that, I'd be happy to yield. Uh, I, as I said, uh, the Ways and Means Committee and the Finance Committee have worked on uh, uh, revenues to pay for what we're going to buy uh, so that we do not create additional debt. And that is my view that they continue to have that intention. Uh, the, uh, there are, ta there are ta use taxes on a lot of things. Uh, and uh, there are other, also corporate uh, taxes in that bill. Uh, there are some uh, additional revenue items in that bill as well. Um, so, but I can't tell you exactly because they have not uh, offered a manager's amendment, which I expect to have uh, offered at the Rules Committee. That does not come out of the Budget Committee, as the gentleman knows. The Budget Committee is going to put together uh, the 12 bills and send them to the Rules Committee, and then the Rules Committee will act on them. And I expect a manager's amendment, but I cannot predict for the gentleman what that manager's amendment will be at this point in time. Did the gentleman know if there's a possibility that the bill before the Budget Committee tomorrow, because they did expedite uh, that hearing there just yesterday, there wasn't supposed to be a Budget Committee on Saturday to take up the reconciliation bill, so clearly it's been sped up. Is that because there's a possibility that the reconciliation bill could be voted on before the House next week? Uh, it's possible. And we will, any idea on when we would find that out? Um, well, we have to see what the Budget Committee does tomorrow. We'll all be watching for sure. Uh, I, I, we all will. <laughs> we all will. Uh, on Monday, the schedule shows that the infrastructure bill is supposed to be coming up before the House floor. Is that going to be for debate and consideration, or will there be an actual vote on Monday night on the infrastructure bill? Well, we'll, see, we'll have to see how uh, the debate goes on Monday, see how long that takes. Well, we uh, will be very involved in that debate as well. Uh, as it relates to the next few weeks, there's been some talk that possibly the week of October 4th or beyond uh, may be taken back as district work schedules to come back here. Does the gentleman have any insight into what the schedule holds uh, from October 4th and beyond? I have advised members that obviously we have a lot of work to do uh, and that uh, we have scheduled a number of work, work weeks, committee work weeks, which by the way, I think have been very successful. We started those in June of last year and I think they've worked out very well, giving the committees an opportunity to meet uninterrupted by having to come to the floor with votes. As we know, we continue to have the challenge, not only of COVID, but the variant uh, and additional illness uh, spike. And uh, so we still are having uh, votes longer than uh, we otherwise would have. So I think the, those work periods have worked very well and there's some scheduled for October, uh, but I've also advised uh, members uh, that uh, uh, you know, we have a lot of work to do, and if we need more legislative time, we'll provide for that, and members will get sufficient notice uh, for that. But I did want to put them on, uh, on notice that uh, we may have to have more floor time than is currently uh, provided for by the committee work week schedule. But, I, but, but we will, as soon as we have a sense of uh, when those days will be needed, we'll let members know. We know that next week, we anticipate as the end of the fiscal year comes that there would be 
uh, the continuing resolution uh, possibly coming out of the Senate. Uh, I know when it came out of the House, it was very clear that the Senate was not going to entertain the debt ceiling as part of the continuing resolution. Uh, so clearly the Senate's going to have to resolve what happens with the debt ceiling, uh, although we've been told extraordinary measures would continue through October, so that's not as looming of a deadline as the September 30th government funding a deadline that the CR would be involved with. Uh, I know on our side, we're very disappointed to see uh, when something had to be pulled out on Tuesday, whether it was going to be the Iron Dome funding or the debt ceiling, knowing that the Senate was not going to process the debt ceiling as part of that, infra that instrument would have seemed to keep that on track to remove the debt ceiling, deal with that separately as the Senate ultimately will have to, and then keep the CR with the Iron Dome funding moving forward on something that could be a bipartisan vote. Obviously that didn't happen Tuesday. I would expect we'll see something very different happen in the Senate. They may send that back to us sometime next week. Does the gentleman have a, a timeline for what we should expect on legislation dealing with the funding of government prior to the September 30th deadline? Well, obviously the government uh, authority, funding authority ends on September 30th at midnight, the end of the fiscal year. And uh, it is, will be our intention to deal with whatever bill the Senate sends back to us if in fact they do not take our bill. Uh, as, as soon as it comes to us. Uh, we believe that uh, absolutely essential uh, not to shut down government, which is costly, uh, disrupts the American lives of the American people and those who are expecting services, uh, and is irresponsible. Even more irresponsible is uh, uh, not uh, increasing the debt limit. Um, and I have been saddened on a regular basis that our Republican colleagues are prepared to vote for debt limits when you have a Republican president and not when you have a Democratic president, as if somehow it is the president that creates the debt. The president doesn't create the debt. The Congress creates the debt. This is not for debt that we are, may create in the future. It is for debt that we have already created either by cutting taxes, therefore cutting revenues, or by spending money. Uh, the, as you know, the debt limit was substantially increased under the Trump administration uh, in a bipartisan way. But unlike uh, this year, uh, Democrats joined with Republicans to ensure that the full faith and credit of the United States of America was not put at risk. And uh, the President of the United States signed that legislation, uh, a Republican president. So it is, I think, very sad that our Republican friends did not join every Democrat in saying we will not put at risk the full faith and credit of the United States for debts that have been incurred. Now, I've been here for some time, uh, and just to, in terms of the public debt going up, uh, under Bush 1, it went up 55 percent, Clinton 37 percent, Bush 2, 86 percent, Obama 88 percent, Trump 39 percent. Now, obviously, those figures all are based on a lower base than their successor uh, had. Um, but it is interesting uh, that under Ronald Reagan, the debt went up 189 percent. Uh, and he signed every one of those. And he also uh, urged us not to put the credit at risk. In addition, uh, on September 8, 2017, uh, the Republican-controlled House voted 316 to 90 to suspend the debt limit through December 8, 2017, under a deal endorsed by President Truman, by, excuse me, President Trump. The yay votes included Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, Ways and Means uh, Chairman Kevin Brady and Conference Chair Kathy McMorris Rogers. Uh, again, on September 8th, uh, in the Senate, uh, the uh, Republican controlled Senate voted 80 to 17 to suspend the debt limit through December 8, 2017. And the yay votes included Majority Leader McConnell, 
Majority Whip Cornyn, Finance Chairman Hatch, and GEO Conference Chair John Thune, all voting in favor of that. Uh, in addition, on February 9th, 2018, a year later, the Republican-controlled House voted 240 to 186 to suspend the debt limit through March 1st, 2019. Voting yay were Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, Majority Whip Steve Scalise, Ways and Means Chairman Kevin Brady, GOP Conference Chair Kathy McMorris-Rogers, all voting for the measure. Uh, Leader McConnell uh, has stated that it would be irresponsible uh, not to uh, extend either the date or the amount of the debt limit. Uh, the Business Roundtable has said this, failure to lift the U.S. federal debt limit to meet the U.S. obligations would produce an otherwise avoidable crisis and pose unacceptable risks to the nation's economic growth, job creation, and financial markets. Goldman Sachs has essentially said the same thing. The American Bankers Association and numerous other organizations that I could mention. Uh, so I was sorry uh, that earlier this week, the Republicans voted unanimously against keeping the government open and making sure that we did not compromise the full faith and credit of the United States of America. But I will assure the gentleman, as soon as a bill is sent back from the Senate, uh, that we will uh, take that up. I hope it is a responsible bill. I hope it uh, uh, does what uh, Senator McConnell, under President Donald Trump, said uh, ought to be done. Perhaps now that uh, we have a Democratic president, somehow the fiscal responsibility does not seem as, as important as it did when Donald Trump was president. And I think that's unfortunate. I personally, by, by the way, think the debt issue is a phony issue. There are only a very, very few countries that have a debt limit. The debt limit is decided when we spend money or cut revenues, uh, not in some other venue. And once we do that, the assumption ought to be, and I sh think has been, uh, that we're going to pay our debts as a country. And the only time we came close to not doing that was about uh, a little less than 10 years ago. And for the first time since I've been a member of Congress, which is over 40 years, the debt, uh, the, the rating of the United States was reduced, minusculely, but nevertheless reduced, a shocking consequence of playing games with the debt limit. So I would hope that my friend would urge his party uh, to, to not treat this as either a political issue or a partisan issue, and would treat it as the issue it is an issue of fiscal responsibility and full faith and credit in the United States of America. I yield to my friend. Well, I thank the gentleman for yielding, but I want to remind the gentleman that if you go back both Republican and Democrat presidents, uh, whether it was a Republican Congress or a Democrat Congress, you had budget agreements that involved both agreements on spending and on debt, bipartisan agreements. The gentleman should also recognize that this year there has been no such effort to reach out to the Republican side to get agreements. Uh, the gentleman's well aware uh, that under President Biden, while he promised during the campaign that he would work with everybody, he would work with Republicans, work with Democrats. Instead, it's been a go it alone strategy on spending and on debt. Very much to our opposition, we were against the trillions in new spending. Uh, we weren't consulted about the debt. Will, will the gentleman the, yield? And, and, and gentlemen, I'll yield, but I first need to point out, because the gentleman did mention, that when we cut taxes, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, that cutting taxes reduced revenue to the Treasury. Maybe under a liberal ideology, that's the thought process of how economics would work, but that's not how economics work, and it's not how reality worked. When we cut taxes, we actually kick-started our economy. We brought millions of jobs back to America, and the federal treasury took in more money. Cutting taxes brought in more revenue to the treasury. And in fact, you go look at states like New York that raise taxes to try to go after millionaires and billionaires and picking winners and losers and dividing people. 
as they raise tax rates, they see people moving out of their state, less revenue. In America, when we saw higher and higher tax rates, ultimately getting to a 35% corporate rate, highest in the industrialized world, what we also saw was great companies moving out of America, out of America to be able to stay afloat, not to avoid paying taxes. They were still paying taxes. They were just moving to other countries where they could remain competitive because they could no longer remain competitive in America. And it was by the hundreds that we would see what are called inversions, great companies moving out of America. Now on the left, every time they'd move, they would just wring hands and call the company's name. We would call the companies and say, why are you leaving? They didn't want to leave. They wanted to stay afloat so that they didn't have to fire the thousands of American workers they had. They wanted to stay viable. And so when we cut taxes, do you know since the day the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was signed into law, there's not been a single inversion in America. Not a single American company moved out of America. In fact, the opposite. We saw companies by the droves moving back in. We saw jobs by the millions coming back to America. So again, to give an economics lesson, when we cut taxes, the federal treasury actually took in more money, not less, because people created more jobs in America. They brought jobs back to America. Companies increased wages. In fact, the biggest wage earners, and you can go look at the Department of Labor statistics, biggest wage earners were lowest income workers. All that goes away if this bill coming before the Budget Committee tomorrow is to pass. I hope it doesn't. But if it does, every economic expert that looks at the success of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act has also recognized that it will lead to millions more jobs leaving America if they raise those rates. You put in natural gas tax on families, estimates are over 12% increase in household electricity rates on families, which, by the way, would hit lower-income people the hardest. That's the reality of tax increases and tax decreases. And so that brings us to the debt ceiling. The reason we voted against it were many. One was that for whatever reason, the majority party decided to gut the Iron Dome funding that was initially in the bill. A billion dollars to allow Israel to replenish the Iron Dome missiles that were used defending themselves against terrorist attacks from Gaza, fueled by terrorist organizations and backed by proxies like Iran. That's one of the driving reasons that you saw all of those no votes. But if you also look at where the debt came from, it came from very partisan policies. There's 14 different bills this year where the majority party waived the PAYGO rules. PAYGO was a policy that said you pay as you go. You want to pass policy, you want to spend money, pay for it. It's a pretty common sense idea, except on 14 different pieces of legislation this year, the Democrat majority waived PAYGO, racking up trillions in new debt. We didn't vote for this spending. If the majority party wants to go it alone and have a partisan spending spree that jacks up trillions in new spending and debt, then it's incumbent upon the majority party to go address the debt ceiling consequences that were created by this reckless spending. 14 different times your party waived PAYGO. We didn't vote for that. But then you want us to pay for it? It's not how this works. If the majority party wants to work with us on a budget agreement, we're right here. We've never been asked to be a part of a budget agreement. We surely weren't consulted about the spending because we opposed those levels. There were things we wanted to do, including uh, on some of uh, the relief packages where we felt let's focus in on helping people who are struggling, not paying people not to work, not bailing out states that are flush with multi-billion dollar surpluses while sending that bill to our kids, that's not responsible, but that's what the majority party did. Exactly. And as they jacked up all that spending, they jacked up debt and bumped us against the debt limit. We're not gonna be a part of that because we didn't agree with the spending. We weren't consulted on the spending. If your party wants to spend money, your party ought to be responsible enough to deal with the consequences of it. Uh, but we're more than happy to work with you on how to solve the spending and debt problem in a bipartisan way. And I would yield back to the gentleman on that. I thank the gentleman. Uh, it's hard to respond, Mr. Speaker, to a non-responsive issue on uh, why we're not voting to extend the debt limit. Uh, McConnell said he wasn't going to vote for the debt limit long before there was anything about Iron Dome. And in fact, we passed Iron Dome. We passed it overwhelmingly with over 400, well, it was 420 votes. It's now over in the Senate. I hope they'll pass it immediately. 
um, which would, by the way, be faster than they would have done the CR. Um, but having said that, the gentleman voted for $5.3 trillion of debt in 2020. Wasn't paid for. We were confronting a great crisis <clears throat> called COVID-19. And in a bipartisan way, we passed $5.4 trillion of spending. Trillion. The largest amount of spending, I think, in any year that I've been in this Congress. And we did it in a bipartisan way. With the expectation we would borrow that money to meet the emergency that confronted us and that we would pay for that debt. It didn't have anything to do with politics. It didn't have anything to do with who was president of the United States. And all that verbiage uh, was to mask the fact that, frankly, my Republican friends don't like voting to pay the bills. They do like to cut revenues, whether or not they balance the budget. And the good news from their standpoint was they hired, they inherited an economy that was going up incrementally every year. The gentleman talks about jobs on his tax bill. Under President Obama, who inherited a tanking economy from George Bush, notwithstanding the tax cuts that they had affected. During the Obama administration, we created 10,838,000 jobs. During the Trump administration, 6,688 net jobs, about 35 percent less. But that's irrelevant. It is a smokescreen. It is to distract. The fact of the matter is, we have incurred debt. We have incurred it in a bipartisan way, whether the objective was defense or whether domestic or tax cuts. We created the debt on behalf of the United States of America. And we borrowed money and we said to our creditors, we will pay you back. It had nothing to do with Iron Dome. The Republicans had said if the debt limit was in there, they weren't going to vote for it. They were not going to take responsibility for the debt that they, in a bipartisan way, $5.4 trillion last year incurred, signed by Donald Trump. Donald Trump could have stopped every nickel of that money from being spent. He did not. It was a bipartisan agreement. And I believe, although I don't have the figures in front of me, that Mr. Scalise voted for every one of those bills. He can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But the debt limit is a pretense that somehow if you vote against raising the debt limit, you will somehow solve the debt problem in the United States. No, the way you solve that is paying your bills. And I would urge the gentleman, I don't know what's going to come back from the Senate. But I will tell you, my experience has been, particularly over the last uh, about 15 years, it's been Democrats who have responded to the fiscal responsibility call of Republican speakers, Mr. Boehner and Mr. Ryan, who couldn't get the majority of Democrat, uh, Republicans in their own party to vote for their bills exercising fiscal responsibility. And I'm proud to say that Democrats were there on behalf of bills sponsored, essentially, I don't know they were the named sponsor on the bill, but supported by both Speaker Boehner and Speaker Ryan. I don't have those figures in front of me, but I can bring them up uh, perhaps next time we talk. So I would urge my friend, let's get off this political Biden this, or the, I don't even know whether any of those bills have passed that the gentleman, because I don't know what list he's reading from, but Mr. Speaker, he lists the name of bills in this Congress. Uh, we passed the rescue plan. 
got no Republicans on that. Why? Because we had a, uh, we were over having a, a Republican president. So now a Democratic president was trying to make sure that this country didn't fall through the floorboards, that our small businesses didn't small, fall through the small board, that our families and individuals didn't fall through uh, the floorboards, uh, that our child care uh, providers didn't fall through the floorboards. So they were, they were through voting for those bills. They voted for them when Trump was president, but stopped voting for them when Biden was president. I get that. But the debt limit is about all of us. It's about our country. And very frankly, as Goldman Sachs and the Business Roundtable others know, it is about the global economy. It is about jobs. It is about working men and women having jobs and America being competitive with the rest of the world. That's what the debt limit's about. And that's what the Business Roundtable is saying, not, not one of our spokes uh, organs. Uh, that's what the Chamber of Commerce uh, is saying. So, um, yes, I, we can argue the specifics. The four million less jobs that were created under Trump than were created under Obama, we can talk about that. We can talk about a larger debt under Trump. Uh, in terms of actual dollars. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Why? Because we incurred them together. Because we needed to do so. Because our country was in trouble and our people were in trouble. So I will, I'll tell the gentleman we're going to, his question was, in case we all forgot it, and probably did, that we're going to deal with the uh, uh, bill that comes back and because we are absolutely committed uh, to making sure that the full faith and credit of the United States is not put at risk. I yield back. And thank the gentleman. I do need to correct the record because the gentleman implied that the relief packages from 2020 were part of the debt ceiling that is being raised in the current legislation that's moving forward. That's just not accurate. I've seen talking points out there. But if you look at the trillions that you and I supported that were good policy, that was included in the debt ceiling negotiation from last year. It was in there. It was part of the debt ceiling negotiation from last year. That was passed on a bipartisan basis. What we're talking about for this year, including the $1.9 trillion that was not a bipartisan package, is new debt. What's being anticipated in the four, five trillion dollar package that the budget committee is taking up is going to be new debt that would be included in the debt ceiling negotiation that you would expect us to vote for. Uh, we don't support that new spending, that new debt. We did support the spending and the debt from last year and the relief packages that we all supported, and we paid for it in the debt ceiling negotiations from last year. Gentlemen might have different talking points, but that is a fact. It was legislation that was voted on in a bipartisan fashion. Well, it was voted on, it was voted on in a bipartisan basis and was passed by Congress. Where the debt ceiling is today is ultimately going to be negotiated in the Senate, but it won't be in the bill that was sent over to the Senate on Tuesday. Senators have made that clear. They don't have 60 votes for that bill. It's a 60-vote bill. They might have to take it up under a reconciliation package. That's for the Senate to decide. Maybe the, in the next few days the Senate decides that and sends it back. But that was not uh, something that anybody expected the Senate to pass when it left the House on Tuesday. And I would yield. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, I will not characterize the substance of that argument. However, I believe it has no merit, Mr. Speaker, none, zero, zip. It's as if we Democrats, when we voted three times uh, to assure that we didn't violate the debt limit under Donald Trump, as if we would say, well, this is not our debt. This was, after all, the debt of the tax cut of 2017. So we shouldn't pay this. In fact, the debt, of course, like family debt, is not necessarily for the car, for the mortgage, for the clothes that we bought for our children to go back to school. It is a cumulative debt. A cumulative debt uh, that, uh, by the way, uh, under Democratic presidents since D President Truman uh, were increased 24 percent. Under Republicans since Truman, 45 percent. 
It would be ridiculous, Mr. Speaker, for me to say, well, I'm only going to pay for this debt, that debt, and this debt that I agree with. Of course, the $5.4 trillion that Mr. Scalise and I voted for in uh, uh, 2020 is a part of the debt that we need to have to service now. And in fact, what we of course did, we didn't increase the debt limit per se, because politically that was very controversial because people demagogue it. So what we did was we changed the date, mm -hmm. but it was covered. which is a ruse, which is a political uh, sleight of hand. It has the same exact effect. So, Mr. Speaker, with all due respect, the argument that it's not my debt and your debt and this debt, in fact, most of those bills haven't passed, haven't created any debt yet. I don't know the list, so I don't know whether all haven't passed or some have passed. I presume, obviously, the rescue plan uh, did pass. It wasn't paid for. Of course, it was uh, uh, approximately 30% uh, uh, of what Mr. Scalise and I voted for in 2020. Uh, but nevertheless, the debt is the debt. And not to support making sure that America legally can pay that debt is irresponsible. I yield. And again, this will continue as we see whatever comes out of the Budget Committee. That would be trillions. We know it's trillions. We just don't know how many, maybe four, maybe five trillion in new debt that the date that was put in the legislative text. It wasn't an amount. It was a date that the majority party included, December of 2022, that I mean, maybe that changes in the Senate, but it would include the trillions, not only that were included in the 1.9 from earlier this year that was partisan, but also on this tax and spend bill that's moving through budget tomorrow. Uh, I would like to ask one final question about other potential legislation for next week, and I know the gentleman and I have had conversations in the past about bills that maybe aren't currently scheduled that could be. Some of them have been added to the schedule, not all. Uh, but we know there's a crisis at our southern border. There are a number of legislative instruments that have been filed to try to confront it. I haven't seen any of those come to the floor. They're surely not listed for next week. But there are a number I'd like to at least bring to the gentleman's attention to see if they could, as we're watching the border get even more out of hand, to potentially give tools to the president to address it in a way where he's not addressing it today. And we know uh, there's been a bill by Ms. Harrell, uh, pull the number of that bill, it's H.R. 471, the Pause Act, it would allow for enforcement of Title 42 in a way more clear uh, than the administration has expressed uh, their abilities. Uh, we also have H.R. 4828 by Mr. Katko, uh, which gives even more additional tools to help secure the border. I would hope the gentleman would look at those legislative instruments. And as there's maybe more days will be here than there's legislative instruments anticipated, these could be uh, other bills that we could take up that would deal with very pertinent, serious problems that our country's facing that aren't being addressed. And I would yield. Uh, I don't know the status of those bills. So I will check on those, uh, the status of those bills. Let me say, Mr. Speaker, and there's a tragedy occurring at our border. There are uh, people uh, in grieving circumstances, in unbearable uh, danger in, in their home uh, countries. Um, and that has been a case for some period of time. And, and uh, we have some very bad people taking advantage of that and promising them uh, a free route uh, to America, um, taking advantage of, those, of that pain and that suffering and that fear uh, that so many people have. Uh, in this case, Haitians who fled their own country, presumably many of them after an extraordinary earthquake, and are living in places that are not their homes. Um, and we all talk about it, and we all believe it that America is the greatest country on the face of the earth. It is. And therefore, it's not surprising that people who are in pain and grieving uh, and concerned for the future of their children uh, want to come to the United States of America. Uh, but clearly, we cannot take uh, all of the people who would like to come to America. And therefore, we need a system 
because America is made up of immigrants, has been made strong by immigrants, has been made successful by immigrants, has been made a great country by immigrants. My own father came from Denmark at the age of 32 in 1934. Almost everybody that serves in this house, some are immigrants themselves who came themselves to this country, some at two years of age, some at other ages. The gentleman's correct. We need, to, we need to deal with this. We need to deal with it in a humanitarian way, in a way that honors our values and respect for individual lives and individual persons. That's one of the great, great differences that we celebrate in America, the importance that we put on the individual. And we said that. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and today we clearly would say all men and women, are created equal and endowed not by us, not by our Constitution, not by our laws, but by God. And we have some of God's children who are fearful and scared and running, running to a safer place. Uh, and that place for almost all the world is America. And so we have a responsibility, Mr. Speaker, to adopt a rational, comprehensive immigration reform regime where people will know the rules of coming to America. They'll know the rules of how you apply and how you're processed and how you're vetted. Uh, whether you're coming here because uh, you just want to come to America to succeed and to make your family live in a better neighborhood called America, or you're coming because your family and yourself are unsafe in the country in which you then reside. We need a comprehensive immigration reform. And I would be glad to work very closely with my uh, friend, uh, the Republican whip from Louisiana, on seeing if we can get to that place, because we've been talking about it, all of us. All of us, there's not a person, I think, I don't know about in this room, but over the years, that hasn't said our immigration system is broken, that hasn't said we need secure borders, that hasn't said and uh, reveled in the fact that immigrants, that we are a nation of immigrants who have made us stronger so that we can get to a place where we pursue a rational policy for implementing that concept. So I will tell my friend, I will look at that, uh, those two pieces, uh, two or three pieces of legislation that you mentioned and talk to the committee chairs about their status and let you know. I yield back the balance of my time. I appreciate that. I look forward to having those conversations with the gentleman from Maryland on that and all the other issues that will come before us next week. With that, uh, thank you. Thank you, gentleman from Maryland. Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The chair will now entertain requests for one minute.